Hello and welcome to the latest in our series of webcasts ahead of next year's Scottish independence referendum. Joining us from our Washington studio to discuss the economics of an independent Scotland is Professor Andrew Hughes-Hallett from George Mason University near Washington, D.C. Professor Hughes-Hallett is also a member of the Scottish Government's Council of Economic Advisers and he's here to answer questions sent in by BBC readers, viewers and listeners. Professor Hugh Sallett, let's start first of all by asking where you stand on the question of independence. Uh, you want a personal opinion or a professional opinion? I don't think, I don't think you want a personal opinion. Um, as a member of the Council of Economic Advisers, it's important to state up front that's not part of the Scottish Government. And therefore, <clears throat> on those issues, I'm independent in the, in the following sense. Uh, that Given that the White Paper came out last uh, Tuesday, um, I've not had any hand in the writing of that, uh, nor have I actually even had time to read it, not surprisingly, at 667 pages. Um, but uh, I do have some influence over the kind of arguments that can be brought to bear in, on uh, whether Scotland could um, operate successfully as an independent country. OK, well, as you'll know, many of the political arguments particularly have been over currency, uh, and we have a number of questions on, on that. This from Stephen Bishop in Essex, who says, can an independent Scotland force a currency union on the rest of the UK? Well, the first answer to say it's already been in a currency union for 300 years. It's not a question of forcing it. It already is in one. The question is, uh, an independent Scotland um, going forwards, uh, what arrangements for running that union would be acceptable to both sides, with the, to the advantage of both sides. That's where the argument is. Uh, to take the question much more crudely, um, is, there's, no, there's nothing which uh, the, the Bank of England or the British government could do to stop Scotland using the pound if she so wished. It might not be very desirable, uh, as opposed to a jointly run, that's to say, a multi-bilateral arrangement by agreement between the two countries. So you might want not to choose that option, but you could always have that option if you wanted. The Scottish the Government, is of all course... all about the running of it, not the existence of it. Yeah, the Scottish Government, of course, says that it would be a period of negotiation. But this question uh, comes from Bruce Anderson, who says, uh, why might a currency union with an independent Scotland not be acceptable to the UK? In other words, in what uh, circumstances might the remainder of the UK... Uh, wish not to go into a formal currency union? It might not want to, uh, possibly because they fear the um, implications should uh, there be financial difficulties of one kind or another in one place or the other. So I think a lot of, a lot of the argument at the moment is actually political posturing, but they can, people take the line that, uh, for example, if one of the banks got into trouble, what would the bailout arrangements be under the independent, and I mean independent from government, uh, Bank of England? Um, in that regime, of course, it would be the bank for the whole of the UK, as it is now. Uh, what would those arrangements be? Um, and that's a fear that a lot of uh, countries have had, and, and indeed the central banks trying to run a, a currency union system, for example, in the Eurozone. How do you run a bailout arrangement, they call it in the language, uh, the resolution mechanism? That's something which has caused a lot of high blood pressure in, in Europe in the euro system. And so that's the area in which people probably would worry about it in the first instance. In the other second instance, they might worry about it because uh, there's an implicit, not explicit, and it might never be activated, but implicit uh, agreement, possibly, anyway, possibility, that the central bank would be called to bail out a government that got into trouble because it allowed its fiscal policy to run out of control. At the moment, that's far greater worry for Scotland that the UK fiscal position would run out of control than it is for the UK uh, worrying about the Scottish position, if for no other reason because the rest of the UK is ten times bigger. Well, we'll possibly talk about fiscal measures in a moment, but staying with the currency, Alex MacDonald in Fife says uh, that you've argued uh, that a currency union uh, is the best option, but what if that can't be agreed? What do you think uh, Mr Salmon's plan B should be? Now that's difficult of course because one never wants to go into plan A saying that you've got a plan B, but of the, of the two remaining options I suppose, one would be going for the euro and the other would be 
a, a freestanding currency, which of those might you choose or might you advocate? Uh, well, I don't know what he would choose, and I don't think he would um, open up on that at all at the moment. If I were in his position, I wouldn't. But <clears throat> I mean, the options are, as you absolutely rightly say, you can have a currency union shared as, as it is at the moment, uh, or you can have um, a unilateral using of, the, of sterling by Scotland, uh, which is what I mentioned a moment ago, or uh, you can have your own Scottish, for the sake of argument, Scottish pound, uh, and there are different ways you could run that, but one of the ways of running it is a currency board, which is exactly what happens in um, the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands right now and Gibraltar. Uh, or you can uh, adopt somebody else's currency, uh, a completely different one. The euro is one option. Um, there's nothing to stop you picking another one again uh, beyond that. So there's a whole range of options. And it would require quite some detailed work to decide what the pluses and the minuses are under each so I'm fairly convinced that, you could, that the, the original you know, plan A, if you like. Yeah, so you're saying that you could use yes, the euro, though, without actually joining the formal euro mechanism? Yeah, well, Montenegro does exactly that. Okay, well, that, that takes us to another so it's question. Possible. Yeah, it takes us to a question from Dr. Colin J. Smith, which uh, is about that. He says, uh, could you explain in straightforward terms why a currency zone, a union, is preferable to... Uh, just a new Scottish pound which simply links its rate of exchange to sterling in the way that the Irish punt did for many years. So that's pegging to another currency. Yeah, right. Uh, and <clears throat> if you had a sufficiently hard peg, and I suggest a currency board is the way to do that, uh, the, so the probability of that peg ever getting broken is extremely small. Uh, Hong Kong does that, for example, uh, with respect to the US dollar. Um, and hasn't changed in uh, 40 years, um, then uh, that, that's, that's uh, going to leave very little difference from having a, an official currency union, with the exception that you don't have any influence over the setting of policy within the uh, currency zone to which you've pegged yourself. So uh, you could perfectly well do that. The, the uh, disadvantage, and it's not... Uh, all that small, the disadvantage is uh, that you don't have a um, seamless transaction. That means to say every time you make a transaction from uh, in one currency into the other, you have to make uh, a conversion. And there are costs associated with that. And there's always the risk, the uncertainty that uh, there might be some uh, disturbances in the markets which uh, you couldn't deal with. And consequently, that has a, a, a downward effect. So it's not as good as, but it's not a bad option. Well, just leaving currency for the moment, um, because there are a number of other factors which people uh, have been writing to us about. I'm just talking about macroeconomics uh, for a moment um, and touching on uh, your first report, uh, Macroeconomic uh, Framework. E. Dodd of Dumfries and Galloway wrote in to ask, which was really quite a personal question. He says, what do you make of politicians describing that as written on the back of a cigarette packet? Well, it's a 200 and something page cigarette packet, and that's 220 something pages more than you get any, any, any response from London. There's no proposed framework from uh, their side as to how these things should work. So, you know, some people might regard that as a cigarette packet, but it's, I think, a lot better than whatever else is out there. OK, well, let's get on to some of the issues uh, about Scotland's economy and uh, the, how the macroeconomics of, of Scotland uh, works. And here's a question from Ian Bonner, who's actually asking, uh, because this gets to the idea of um, the Scottish economy and how it would grow. Um, and uh, he's saying, I'm interested to know what might happen to the UK and Scottish economies in the first five to ten years after a yes vote. Is there likely to be a tough period for Scotland and a boost for the rump UK? He goes on to ask about the Czech and Slovak economies um, after they separated. I mean, can we look abroad and see how it might pan out in the event of a yes vote? Yeah, well, the Czech and Slovak uh, case is, is an interesting one. Um, and uh, without going into any great details, I think before they actually did it, and I have to say that it was by mutual agreement uh, beforehand, there wasn't a referendum, it was by mutual agreement that uh, the separation took place. Um, I think they thought it was going to be very difficult. I know that they set aside a period of two years for uh, 
making the transition and expecting bumps and things along the road, which uh, I'm sure they had. But uh, looking back ex post, having done it, uh, they found it was much easier than they thought. And both economies prospered uh, without any doubt. And uh, I mean, you can go into the reasons for, in their case, why that was. You could go into the reasons why you might expect that in the case of Scotland and uh, the rest of the UK. Um, if there are enough trade, strong trading relationships between the two parts, and uh, you've put in place enough, um, uh, what should I say, framework uh, to, to stabilize the financial arrangements, there's no reason why this shouldn't uh, proceed um, very positively. Uh, in the plenty of reasons, I suppose, it would be in the, rest, in the rest of the UK's advantage, as well as, as in Scotland's advantage. I take that to be the purpose behind the question. Indeed. The same thing happened uh, here in America uh, in uh, 1782, after the peace treaty was signed. Trade took off like a rocket right, between well, the two countries. That's going back a long way. But just on the subject of how you can grow the Scottish economy, because a lot of the... Um, predications of the white paper were about being able to grow the Scottish economy uh, and fund the, the sort of fiscal gap between what Scotland would uh, raise in taxes uh, and spend. I mean, how easy is it for governments of small countries to boost the GDP of the country? Uh, well, I think the, uh, and I'll take those in two parts. First of all, the question on just growing the economy per se. <clears throat> I think the track record, if you look at the small countries, uh, certainly across Europe, uh, they have done uh, proportionately better than the big countries in, in recent years. And, and part of the reason is because part of the, the policy process is much more accessible. You know, you're dealing with some uh, much more manageable sized problems. It's less complicated and complex. And so they find it easier to uh, introduce policies. Now, that's, so that's the plus side. The, the minus side is that they might or might not, depending on which economy you're looking at, be more vulnerable. The Scandinavians have proved very resilient and they've done very well in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and the Baltics went up and down with, uh, not quite like a yo-yo, but fairly, fairly violently as the uh, financial crisis hit and are all busy recovering. And I think you'll be pretty happy with the results if you lived there now. So it's, it's, it's something which is manageable and a d to a degree more manageable in a small country than a than a big country. Part of it has to do with more coherent, uh, more coherent and homogenous society and more coherent politics so you don't get the big fights, um, which means it's easier to bring uh, new policy measures through and bring them on. That's, I'm just talking in general about those uh, smaller economies. The fiscal question is a bit different uh, and there I think we need to probably spend a bit of time because the fiscal position, uh, when you look in detail at what the numbers would look like, and I emphasize the word would, uh, under an independent regime or a fiscally autonomous regime uh, for Scotland are rather different from what are usually discussed. And I don't think, although the uh, Scottish economy is running a deficit at the moment, on the current account, fiscally speaking, it's relatively small, a lot smaller than the rest of the UK. And uh, so that's something which is pretty manageable. So it's not something which I would have thought was a, a complete deal breaker. Of course, the IFS, uh, in its most recent report, seemed to suggest that, uh, the, that Scotland would have some difficulty over the long term, although they go on to 50 years. That was a point that Alan Sharp um, raised. And Chris Anderson asks, uh, because a lot of the promises in the white paper seem to involve higher spending, things like free childcare, uh, and with the promise not to increase the basic rate of income tax, how would you see the government paying for those? If, I suppose if growth uh, doesn't happen, which taxes would have to be raised? Well, they would have, uh, under the independent scenario, they would have uh, access to <clears throat> the full range of taxes. So um, unlike what happens at the moment, if there is a, a problem appearing at that time and you need to raise, ta raise taxes, you can raise taxes. And it doesn't necessarily mean the rate. It also means uh, that you can expand the tax base um, or you can do something about all the exemptions. Uh, you know, this is an area which is uh, highly fought over in Washington, but it's probably more effective in terms of increasing the actual revenues um, than, than other measures. So all of those things are open under a, um, um, an independent scenario. I'm not in a position to say what they would do. 
under those circumstances, I'm not in government, so I'm not in a position to say what I would do if I oh, were indeed. in government well, either. <laughs> but uh, it's, it, it's it, no, it would be great fun, I, I agree, and I wouldn't mind playing around with it, but uh, it's, it's, it's very possible. I mean, that's, that's the main thing. My, my position in all of this is not to take a position on, you must do this. I'm not in the business of uh, advocating one policy against another. It's a question of, of uh, analysing and saying what is possible, how might it be done. And uh, there are there are lots of possibilities. But I mean, just to go back to the beginning of the uh, the fiscal position, there are, I don't know the IFS paper uh, that you're referring to. I think if it's the one that's been quoted recently, is actually about the demographic problems. How are you going to pay for pensions and things in 50 years' time? And uh, if they can make a prediction that's got some validity of 50 years out, uh, I think they perhaps should um, sell their services more widely because I don't think anybody else in the world can do that. Um, if I understood that paper correctly, it's based on the fact that they reckon the growth of the population in Scotland and the rest of the UK is about the same, and uh, on the other hand, that people in Scotland retire earlier. Those two assumptions can only be consistent if people are dropping out of the labour force at an earlier date. So you've got a, a lower participation rate of the potential uh, labour force uh, into actual work. But since the numbers show that the participation rate in Scotland is, if anything, higher than the rest of the UK, it strikes me that assumption is um, inconsistent and, 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 and not right. So I don't know how they've reached those figures without um, looking at that paper. OK, well, let's, let's leave the IFS the, paper. Um, There's been a, a lot of talk about the IFS paper. I, I, I don't have a lot of time left. I want to just throw out a couple of ideas to you from uh, those who have uh, written to us. Ian Hunter uh, asks, uh, should we be scrapping the council tax and introducing some new form of taxation? Uh, this would be a property or land valuation taxation. I think some people have talked about that as a way of, of raising more money from assets that can't be moved out of the country. Yes, that's a, certainly a possibility, and I've heard people talking about that. Uh, it's not for me to say uh, whether the government would want to do that or not. <clears throat> I have no idea. Obviously, if you're running uh, taxation in a relatively small economy, the, the danger is that the assets you're trying to tax uh, move out of the economy. Um, and that's why people will advocate such a tax. That argument's fine, um, and so that's an, indeed a possibility. On the other hand, you don't want to rely entirely on property taxes and things of that kind. Uh, they've tried that in the US, and when you get a downturn, um, you don't have any me mechanisms to... Uh, recover for the shock of the loss of the revenues um, because you're stuck with whatever you know, land and housing stock you've got. So I wouldn't want to have all my eggs in one basket on, on that if I were doing it. Okay, uh, there is some advantage in taxing things which are mobile because, because like I say, there is some advantage in taxing some uh, items which are mobile because by that means you can attract them in. Um, and uh, so that's another reason why you want to have a broader uh, palette of different taxes you could use. Well, the, the, the uh, Scottish Government indeed, um, within the White Paper, uh, mentions corporation tax. Uh, and their view is that they should aim for a corporation tax uh, some 3% uh, lower than the UK. Some critics have said that would mean a race to the bottom. What you're trying to do is attract a business and industry uh, to a lower tax regime. Yeah. What do you, what's your view on that? Well, it, it might do, but <clears throat> um, I mean, that's the kind of thing which has been studied widely in the U.S. Uh, do, all the different states have different corporation tax rates, and after a while, you, you might think there was going to be a race to the bottom. What actually happens is the populations in those states demand a certain level of public spending and social services or whatever it is, and therefore you get yourself into, into, into real trouble with the population and your voters if you reduce the corporation tax too much so that it's obvious you can't provide the services you just promised. So in practice, you don't get that kind of race to the bottom. OK, we've, we've not got much time left, but let me just ask you this finally, uh, Professor Hughes Hallett. Um, you speak, uh, obviously you're in the States, but you speak all around the world uh, on this and, and the subject of um, economies uh, between uh, countries. I just wonder how you feel this debate here in Scotland has taken off around the world. Do you feel that people are talking about it? Do you hear more talk about next year's referendum? Uh, yes, you hear a fair amount, but it's... Um um, what should I say, people who are more uh, concerned about world affairs and, uh, and um, you know, what's going on. Uh, so it's not, it's not um, on the streets conversation as such. Uh, 
Uh, one of the problems that uh, has happened is, is that until the white paper, certainly, um, it's difficult to get people to actually focus, even within the UK, uh, to get people to focus on what the issues are, as opposed to what the posturing <laughs> is, yeah. if you understand me. Okay. Well, um, Professor Andrew Hughes and, uh, Hallett. Uh, you know, as a, uh, um, thanks, uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, there's so much to talk about, but thank you for joining us from okay. Washington. And thank you very much for joining us. For more on the independence debate, including background analysis and the latest developments in the story, go to the BBC Scotland News website and click on Scotland's Future. Goodbye.